Good morning. Uh, we practice here at KCC Open Communion. If you're a believer, new here, and you're a believer in Jesus and want to share in the body of Christ with us this morning, be more than welcome to do so. So, um, in preparing for to this morning's message, um, I was having a hard time trying to come up with a message to share, and I just kind of just kind of dawned on me that you know this is really a, a simple message. Um, we're sinners. We are sinners in need of a savior. It's something we cannot do on our own. Um, and that's why God sent his one and only son, Jesus, to uh, take our place on the cross, take all of our sins, shed his blood, give up his body for us. You know, there's a passage uh, in John, John 14, 6, where Jesus is talking to his disciples. <clears throat> And the disciples, you know, they knew who God was. They believed in God, but they, they weren't real sure who Jesus, you know, what Jesus was all about yet at that time. And Jesus was sharing with them, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father except through me. Jesus is that advocate for us to get to the Father. You know, we can't do it on our own. We can't, uh, you know, coming to church on Sundays, being a good person, it's not going to, it's not going to do it for us. We need to submit ourselves, bow our heads, get on our knees, repent, and ask Jesus to come into our heart. Give him, give him all of our heart, our heart, soul, and mind. Um, so we, when we come to the table uh, this morning and we remember what Jesus did for us, we remember the moment where we got down on our knees, repented, and believed. Um, it's a powerful moment. It's a powerful time where we can thank God, thank Jesus for coming into our hearts and saving us from our sin. When Jesus was on that cross, he came and lived the perfect, sinless, blameless life. That should be us on the cross, not Jesus. But he loved us so much that he took our place on that cross. So as we come to the table this morning, Take, uh, partake in the, the bread and the juice. We remember what Jesus did for us on the cross. Let's pray. Lord, Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for loving us. We thank you for your grace, your mercy. We thank you for your promise. Lord, we, we know we can't do it on our own, and uh, we thank you each and every day for all the blessings that you've given us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning, and thank you for joining us in worship. If you're a guest here today, uh, thank you for coming and, and being with us this morning. Uh, we'd love the opportunity as a staff to be able to connect with you, and so the communication card that's sitting in the seat back in front of you, if you would fill one of those out for us, um, on your way out, there's a box in the entryway that you could drop that card into, and uh, we as a staff will uh, reach back out to you however's convenient for you this week, so thank you for doing that. Uh, tonight is our benevolent auction, and so we invite you to come and be part of that. Uh, there's a couple different ways you can participate in it. Uh, one of those is to make or bring an item to be auctioned off, uh, so you donate an item. And the other, if you don't want to bring something, you're welcome to bring your cash. And <laughs> come and uh, participate in that auction. What we do with the benevolent auction is collect money um, into a fund that we have on hand all year long. And so when a need arises in the church, that we can just go ahead and take care of those needs. And so uh, it is a great way for us to raise money and take care of others uh, throughout the entire year. And so come and be part of it. It's a lot of fun. Uh, the other thing I'd like to draw your attention to is the invitation to come and celebrate Christmas with us. Uh, we gave you a card earlier before, and uh, we're giving you a second one so that you can be thinking about who you're going to invite. And again, there's three identical services during that Christmas weekend, and so you would choose one of those to come and, and be part of. Uh, we are looking for people to help us serve in various roles as greeters or serving communion or doing other things during one of those services. And so if you're willing to help us uh, serve at one of those services, will you let us know which service you'll be coming to uh, so we can uh, put you into one of those places of service. And so that would help us out a lot during that weekend. 
So uh, there's some other things that we can do, uh, just kind of thinking about visitors and uh, many people coming during Christmas. There's some things that we want to do just uh, to help welcome people and, and make them feel like uh, uh, it's comfortable and just a, an easy place to be a part of. And so if you notice the parking lots being full, we do have a new parking lot that is kind of spread out in front of our new addition over here. And we're w welcome to begin using that. It's not just mud, so you won't get stuck. Um, but uh, there is a, a crushed gravel over there, so you're welcome to start parking over in that direction. Uh, the other thing that you guys do a lot better than our first service is you sit forward. So thank you for doing that. Yes, Tom is really excited that you're willing to come and, and be part of the service. And so you're welcome to fill in these chairs right up in front. And, uh, and as services continue to fill up, we ask that you continue to move forward and, and make way for new people to come in. And then the last thing I'd like you to remember is, is that three-minute rule at the end of the service. And so um, if you don't know what that is, I'd love to share it with you. Um, but it's kind of the thing that we're, we're starting around here. Just look around for the new folks that you don't know or maybe a face that uh, has been here for a long time and you just haven't met yet. Take the first three minutes of your time uh, after the service to introduce yourself. Uh, this morning as we dive into the book of James, let's uh, pray together. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for uh, your word and being able to dive into the book of James. I thank you for the practicality of being able to love others the way that you love them. And so help us this morning as we hear again from your word and, um, and when we hear from, from the book of James, help us to uh, realize the next steps that we need to take to be better at um, living like your son. It's in your, his name I pray. Amen. Good morning. If you want, you can uh, turn in your Bible to uh, James chapter 4. If you're using one from the uh, seat in front of you, uh, that's going to be on page uh, 1840. Uh, so I'll share with you guys what I told first service, and that is, uh, you know, hey, if you guys start sitting in the front, I'll start using mouthwash, okay? We'll kind of, you know, both give and take a little bit here and kind of make this work out. Uh, so as we uh, have been reading through the book of James, one of the things that we've challenged you each week is to read that chapter every day or as many days as possible that week. And so if you've been doing that, if you, uh, that first week, if you read James chapter 1 as many times as you could, and then chapter 2, chapter 3, um, if you would, and you've had a positive experience with that, just shoot Chris Chambers an email. His email address is on the back of the bulletin, but just let him know what's one thing that you gained from that. Something that uh, struck you by surprise, something that made it more alive for you, something that you found that just helped you to see or experience God in a different way, just shoot him an email of that, and he's going to kind of pull those together and just kind of share how God had been using that in your lives. So this morning, uh, before we jump into James chapter 4, I'm going to uh, share a little bit from Matthew chapter 14. You don't have to turn there, but I'm just going to kind of summarize for you what happened uh, on this one particular day. And I would say this is an incredibly uh, powerful and uh, significant day in the, in the life of Jesus, but I would not say it was a uh, particularly thrilling day in the life of Jesus. Uh, so in this particular chapter, Matthew chapter 14, it begins with Jesus getting the news that his brother John had been beheaded. Uh, I don't think you've ever had that happen, but I just can't imagine what kind of a punch in the gut that feels like to have your day started with the fact that uh, your cousin was uh, just beheaded for no reason other than uh, sharing exactly what God wanted him to share with people. It wasn't for a crime. It wasn't in retaliation to something he had done. It wasn't for something that uh, he had created a problem. It was simply the fact that uh, there were some people that were opposed to him because he was preparing the way uh, for Jesus. And then after that, there's this uh, large crowd that begins to circle around, and uh, they just want to hear some teaching from Jesus. So Jesus is teaching them uh, the, the numbers that the Bible tells us about, 5,000 men uh, not counting the women and the children. So this is a large crowd of people. And so all of a sudden, as it begins to get a little bit later, a little bit towards uh, dinner time, the disciples are looking around and going, man, I am not sure that there are uh, this many seats in Son of a Butcher and Keeks. So, you know, we better figure out what the plan is here, Jesus. And so they start talking to him, and uh, Jesus said, tell them all to sit down and we'll feed them. 
And it, it's one of those moments where for the disciples, they're like, okay, we get that we're supposed to follow him, but sometimes what he's asking us to do just doesn't make any sense at all. And, but they, they follow through, and so they ask the people to sit down, and then with just five simple loaves and two fish, Jesus feeds 5,000 people, uh, men, plus the women and children. And then when the disciples collect the leftovers, okay, this is where God has a problem with math, they collect more than what they started with. Don't ask me how that works. I just know it's one of those things where God, sometimes when it comes to math, is uh, kind of challenged just a little bit. But here's the good part. He's always challenged in our favor. Okay, we never get the short end of that when it comes to uh, God just multiplying when it comes to math. So Jesus had this incredible moment where he gets to watch the people be fed because he had blessed the food and watched God just keep multiplying it until all the needs were met. He also got to watch the disciples experience this and just watch them grow in their faith and understanding of who Jesus is. They don't fully get it yet. And again, it's easy for us because we have the whole story of Jesus' life, including the resurrection. The disciples don't have that. And so day by day, they're trying to figure out who is this guy completely and how does this whole thing play out? So they've had this incredible experience, and it becomes uh, nighttime, and Jesus is saying at this moment, look, I, I know the way I'm wired. I know what makes me work, and that is my constant connection with God. And so he just says, I just need some time alone to go spend some time with God. Why don't you guys go ahead and get in the boat, and you start heading across the lake. I'll catch up with you later, okay? And so they get in, and they start going through, uh, through the, the lake, and they're rowing, and it said there's a storm, and it's kind of beating against them. It's making it really difficult for them. And then it said, just before dawn, uh, all of a sudden, they start seeing Jesus walking on the water. So just think about that for a moment. That means they've been rowing all night. They're pretty exhausted. They're pretty tired. They're incredibly frustrated with this storm and how hard it's making it is, uh, making it for them to just do what they're supposed to do. They're not trying to do something hard. They're just simply trying to row across the lake. This is a normal thing for them. But all of a sudden, this storm is just making it really miserable. And they look out, and here is something, who knows what, but something approaching them on the water. Now, they didn't immediately think of Jesus. In fact, they initially were scared and thought it was a ghost. And then when he gets a little bit closer, they can see him. And they're like, what? That's Jesus. Okay, there's complete shock in this. They got no clue what's going on. And then I love Peter, and here's why. Peter is a little bit impulsive, but Peter is also really quick to trust. Okay, now sometimes he backs away a little bit later, but initially Peter's really quick to respond and really quick to trust. And so Peter, uh, recognizing that Jesus says, hey, Jesus, if it's really you, call me. Let me come walk out there with you. And so Jesus says, Come. And so Peter gets up, and he starts to step on the water, and uh, he's just being obedient, and he's being faithful, and he's saying, look, I asked him to invite me. He invited me. Here I am. And he's like, wait a minute. I can't do this. I can't. What am I doing out here? There's a storm out here. There's water out here. I can't walk on water. And all of a sudden, he starts to sink. And again, the beauty of Jesus, Jesus just reaches out and grabs his hand and, and pulls him up, and then obviously helps him walk on water to get back into the boat, Okay. Now, why am I telling you that story before we talk about James chapter 4? Here's why. You and I, if we are willing and if we are listening and if we are uh, willing to be led by God, are going to be asked to get out of a boat. So I want you to think for a moment. The boat for the disciples and for, Jesus, and for Peter was everywhere that they felt safe. It was where they felt comfortable. It was where they knew they were protected. It was something familiar. There wasn't a threat to them because they were in the boat. You and I have some of those things in our lives. And that is, there are certain things where we, we just aren't going to have certain conversations. We're not going to do certain things. We're not going to risk uh, stepping out in faith and doing something we've never done before. We're not going to um, challenge ourselves to take a new step in our faith journey with Jesus because... We're much more comfortable in the boat. But if we're going to look at James chapter 4 and do what we're being called to do in this chapter, it's going to require for me and for you for us to get out of the boat. So I hope, uh, and hear this with the absolute purest of heart, I hope you just get really uncomfortable today. And I hope it's because you're thinking about and uh, just considering 
okay, maybe I'll do that. Maybe I'll step out of the boat and I'll trust Jesus and see what happens. All right, let's jump into uh, James chapter 4. Here we go, first three verses. What is causing the quarrels and the fight among you? Don't they come from the evil desires at war within you? You want what you don't have, so you scheme and kill to get it. You are jealous of what others have, but you can't get it, so you fight and wage war to take it away from them. Yet you don't have what you want because you don't ask God for it. And even when you ask, you, do, you don't get it because your motives are all wrong. You want only what will give you pleasure. Anybody want to take a guess what the problem is? Okay, this is not the first time we've heard this. Earlier in James chapter 1, what did we see? We're the problem again when it comes to relationship. The problem in all the relationships I have is there's one person who's in every single one of them that messes them up. It's me. It's not my children. It's not my wife. It's not a coworker. It's not some. I'm the problem in my relationships. The solution is also really easy as well. The solution is simply God. What would it look like if I would take the you out of my life, if I would take the you out of my agenda, if I would take the you out of my priorities and instead put God in place? If God was the one that was driving my agenda, if God was the one that was setting my priorities, if God was the one that was uh, choosing the directions of my life, my life would be radically different. And instead of spending time in arguments and quarrels and um, uh, fights and everything else, I would instead be spending that time saying, what does it look like for me to love my wife the way Jesus does? What would it look for me to cherish my children the way God cherishes them? What would it look for me to love that person that nobody else at work wants to love? What would it look like for me to love that uncle that's the most annoying person in the family? Or in my case, maybe you are that uncle, okay? But the, the reality of it is, we're all being called to stop being about us and instead to be submitting to Jesus. And so uh, there's a verse we're going to look at in just a minute in, in the New Living Translation, but I want to read it for you in just a minute in the New International Version. So let me explain real quick when it comes to different Bible translations. I don't know how much experience you have reading the Bible. If you have one and that's the only one you ever read or if you have multiple ones or you don't even know why they always throw three letters up you know, behind that biblical reference, okay? So let me just explain that to you real quickly. The Bible had been translated with different intentions and different priorities. Doesn't make it right or wrong, but different priorities. So there are some translations that are trying to be ultra, ultra accurate and just translate word for word. But sometimes those are really hard to read because they're just kind of choppy. They're not being translated to read smoothly. They're being translated to be super, super accurate. Other translations have been written with the idea that uh, it allows us to be able to read it to where we can kind of catch the context and we can understand it and the thoughts flow together, and they do that really, really well. And then other translations have said, how could we do this in a way that uh, somebody that doesn't have this reading level and doesn't have a degree in theology can read the Bible and have it make perfect sense? So all of those different translations, that, that's all that that's about. It's about what level of writing is it written to, and what the format or the structure or the intention of the translation. The reason I'm sharing that, to you, uh, sharing that with you is, whenever we put them up on the screen, we're using the New Living Translation because that's what's in the Bible underneath the seat. We're not saying that's a better translation. We're not saying you need to go buy that translation. I just want you to know why we tend to use that translation. Right now, I'm gonna share with you James chapter four, verse seven, from the New International Version because of a, a word in it that I think really brings clarity to what we're talking about this morning. In James chapter 4, verse 7, the first part of it just simply says this, Submit yourself then to God. Submit yourself then to God. Okay, for those of you who don't want to pay attention to the entire message, I'm going to give it away right now. Okay, here it is. Point number one, following Jesus requires complete submission. Following Jesus requires complete submission, okay? We're going to talk about the rest of James chapter 4, but I'll just tell you right there, if you want the answer, there's the answer to everything in the entire chapter, 
all right? Now, if you get uncomfortable with what that looked like for your own life, that just means you're paying attention. Here's the thing about sub submitting to Jesus. It's the safest thing you will ever do, but oftentimes it's the most uncomfortable thing you'll ever do. Here's the thing that uh, I've learned over the years and the thing that we can see when we read scripture is this. Whenever we submit to God's plan, God's will for our lives, we're moving in the direction of what is best for us. Not necessarily what is easiest, not necessarily what is most comfortable, not what is most self-gratifying, but always what is best for us. Sometimes as parents, you ask your children to do things, and they're looking at it and going, why would I want to do that? That's not fun. I would rather go do X, Y, Z. You are asking your children to do that because you're trying to move them in the direction of what would be best for them. In the same way, whenever we submit to God, we are moving in the direction of what is best for us. Now, I don't know if you noticed this, but uh, both in James chapter 1 and here in James chapter 4, when it talks about these uh, arguments and the quarrels and the, quarrels and the je uh, jealousy, it never identified who's right. It never identified who's wrong. Because you know what? That's not the issue. The issue is what's the source of the quarrel? What's the source of the jealousy? What's the source of the fighting? And it's us. It, it's our agenda. It's our priority. It's my desire. It, it sometimes can be our pride or our arrogance or our selfishness. So the issue isn't even what the argument. The issue is we got to get rid of this. The best way I don't know how to do that, and point number one, is that following Jesus requires complete submission. One of the best examples of this, and many of us in this room have done this, but is baptism. If you think about it, baptism is that moment where what I'm doing is I'm saying, look, when I do things my own way, when I'm in charge of my life, when I decide what I want to do, there are times where I make absolutely horrible decisions. There are times where I do things that are absolutely against what God would want. But it's because I'm the one that's trying to be in charge of my life. So at baptism, what I do is I acknowledge, look, I've sinned. I've made a mess of certain areas of my life. And so what I'm going to choose to do is I'm going to say, let's get me off of the throne. Let's get rid of my agenda. And so therefore, we're going to be buried. Why? That's why it's full immersion. The Greek word for baptism just is baptizo, and what it means is to fully immerse or to put something completely under. Why? Because it's portraying something, and that is I'm going to put me completely under, let's bury Tom's agenda, Tom's ideas, and instead now I'm going to choose my absolute best to try to live for Christ. What is that a picture of? That's a picture of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, but it's also a picture of what does it look like for me to fully submit my life to Jesus. There's a reason for that. Now, I want to share with you a quote that I got from the uh, internet from a friend of mine. And uh, the author is not quoted, the name, but here's the quote. And I want you to listen to the whole thing. Here's what it says. When Peter swore that he would die with Jesus, he meant it. I don't think uh, he just lost his nerve when Jesus got arrested. After all, he tried to fight a Roman cohort before Jesus stopped him. He was very willing to die on his terms, fighting. The issue is, he was not willing to die on God's terms, yielding. So here's the question that you and I have to figure out. Is, are we better at fighting? Are we better at quarreling? Are we better at getting our way? Are we better at seeking ourselves? Are we better at protecting our agenda? Or are we better at yielding to God's purposes and trusting God to work out what's best. You see, I think oftentimes we're willing to fully surrender to God as long as he is fully committed to our plan. And yet what God is saying is, do you trust me enough to bury your plan, to bury your agenda, to bury your ego, your pride, and instead choose to just trust me and to follow me, to do exactly what I'm asking you to do. You see, this is a recurring theme that keeps coming up in the book of James. Why is that? Because James is really about how do you live out your faith. James isn't trying to necessarily prove that Jesus is the Son of God. There are other books that are doing that. What James is simply trying to say is, if you say that Jesus is 
the Son of God, Jesus in the flesh, God in the flesh, and you're trying to live for him, this is what it looked like. And so it really comes down to understanding that the more I focus on my life, the more messed up it is. The more I focus on following God, the better my life gets. That's a paradox. And often, as you grow in your faith, and as I grow in my faith, one of the things we find is that in the wisdom of God goes absolutely contrary to what my own human thinking and logic says. My, my human logic says that the best way I can ensure that I have uh, savings and that I'm equipped and that I'm financially stable would be to keep every single penny. That's not the wisdom of God. The wisdom of God says you need to trust me with your finances because I'm the source of every finance you have. Now, here's what I can tell you. God, again, in his messed up math, the more I give away to him, the more I have in saving, the more I have for my youth, the more I have for whatever else I need. I have never in my lifetime, maybe I'm not generous enough, but I have never given away so much that I then went, Oop, now what am I going to do? Okay, I just don't think I'm going to be able to outgive God. The question is, will I submit to God and trust him? Because anybody who has passed the fifth grade in math knows you're going to have less when you give some away. Okay? But God doesn't operate that way. So I want to ask you a question. When you pray, do you start with your thoughts? Do you start with your agenda? Do you start with your questions? Do you start with what's on your mind, what's on your heart? Or do you tend to start by just saying, hey, God, you got my attention. What do you want to say? Hey, God, what, what's on your mind this morning? What's on your heart this morning? God, what do you want me to hear from you? I, I'm going to be just really silent, and I'm just listening. What, what do you want to say to me? i got to tell you, this is, one of, this is the part, probably in the, in the message, that was the hardest for me this week, okay? Because I'm looking at that going, ooh, okay, I don't pass that test. Okay, I tend to share my agenda with God first, and I share what's on my heart. And sometimes it's about other people, but I tend to talk first and listen second. Okay, I know you're not surprised to hear that, right? But I tend to talk first to God and listen second. And so one of the things I need to do is I just need to step back and go, okay, i got to get better at times before I say a word. Just saying, hey, God, what's going on? What are you thinking? And here's the reality. If I start with God, the thing that's going to be at the forefront of my life is his priorities rather than my priorities. What I tend to do is say, hey, I want to talk about everything that's on my heart right now, everything that I'm thinking about, everything I'm focused on right now. And then, oh, yeah, hey, God, is there anything you want to say? It's almost an afterthought. It's like, hey, God, after I get everything about my agenda in place and I got you working with me toward my agenda, now, hey, is there anything that you want to do? Is there anything you want me to be a part of? And instead, I think we need to shift that around. So I want to share with you real briefly from uh, the Lord's Prayer when Jesus was teaching the disciples how to pray. Uh, I just want to read part of a verse for you from Matthew chapter 6, verse 10. It's in the middle of that. But I just wanted you to think, stop and think for a minute. What would happen if this is the way we started our day? What would happen if I started my day just saying, may your kingdom come soon, may your will be done on earth as it is in heaven? How would that change the way that I approach life? Well, the second point is this. The first thing, the second point is this. Following Jesus requires complete submission. Is that sounding a little bit familiar? But here's the deal. If I started my day that way, if you started your day that way, it wouldn't be about me, 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 me. It would be about, God, what do you want? What are you doing that I could come alongside of? God, Who's the person in my world that you're working in their life right now and you're just wanting me to be the hands and feet that love on them a little bit for you? God, what's the thing you're working on in my life that I need to put aside some other things so that I can let you work on that in me? Maybe it's you're trying to teach me to have enough courage to share my faith. Maybe you're trying to challenge me to find a place to serve. Maybe you're trying to challenge me to uh, love that person that's just really super annoying in my life. Here's what I know. I will run out of time to find out what God is doing and pursue it with him if I put my agenda, my priorities, my values first. Does that make sense? 
So if I want to make sure that I run out of time, I want to run out of time on my agenda. I don't want to run out of time on God's agenda. So here's the deal. If you and I started our day that way, if we started with, may your kingdom come soon, may your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, I would tell you that there would be two things that we would be focused on. The first one, and not necessarily in this order, but the first thing we would be doing, if we would be doing, uh, we would be seeking any way we can to help get more people into heaven. So if I'm trying to think about, God, I want your kingdom to come soon, I'm going to be going, man, I want to do everything I can to get as many people into heaven as possible. So if that means sharing with them, if that means inviting them, if that means serving them, if that means giving them some grace, if that means whatever, God, I'm all in. Just help me know who it is you're working on already or help me know how you want me to be invested in that life. But God, I will do anything and everything I can to get as many people as possible into heaven. And then the second part of that is I'll do anything and everything in my power to bring as much of heaven down to earth. Isn't that what it says in that prayer? May your kingdom come, may your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So what does that look like? I think most of us get what it means to say we're going to do everything we can to try to help get people into heaven. But what does it mean when we say we're going to try to bring as much of heaven down to earth as possible? What it means is we're going to start valuing the things that heaven values rather than our 401k. Or we're going to start loving people the way Jesus would love them. We're going to start seeing people from a redemptive story rather than the mistake or the mess that they're in the middle of. We're going to start celebrating the things that get celebrated in heaven rather than celebrating what gets rewarded here on earth. But if you and I did that, if our focus was on doing everything we can to get as many people as possible into heaven and to bring as much of heaven down to earth as possible, you and I wouldn't have anything to argue about. We'd be too busy uh, working with God to be fighting with each other. Now, I want to give you the real simple strategy to do both of those things. If you want to try to help get people into heaven or you want to try to bring as much of heaven down to earth as possible, I'm going to tell you how to do it real quick. And this is from here. Love God and love others. It's not hard. It's not complicated. It's not, you don't have to figure out the strategy. God's not saying, here's what I want you to do. Now, go figure out how. He told us how. The two greatest commands, love God and love others. But what does it look like to love? So let me explain something about God's love. Have you ever seen that God loves you with a bare minimum? You know, kind of like your credit card payment, just the bare minimum, okay? You're not going to make any progress. You're not going to pay the thing off for 48 years. But, hey, if you just want to pay $28, you're good. God doesn't do that. God's love towards us is always extravagant. Now, I want to tell you what that word means. If you look it up in the dictionary, extravagant is exceed the limits of reason. Let that soak in for a moment. God's love towards you, God's love towards me, exceeds all limits of reason. If you think about all the way that God had loved me, all the way that God had pursued me, all the things that God had done in my life, it's ridiculous, okay? He had loved me way beyond reason. It's extravagant. When you think that God would choose to leave heaven, take on the form of a flesh, the flesh, live on earth and die a brutal, painful death so that he could pay for the mistake that you and I made that he did make, that's extravagance. When you think of what God would love to see his church do in terms of impacting the world around us, he doesn't want to bear a minimum. He wants extravagance. If you want to know how you're supposed to be treating that person that's in your life, again, family member, friend, coworker, whatever, don't, don't do the bare minimum. Do something extravagant. They ought to be blown away by your love. You know why? Because the Bible teaches that we should be known by our love. I'm not going to be known by making the minimum payment due. I'm going to be known by doing something just over-the-top, crazy, extravagant in my love. People should be able to tell by the fact that you are absolutely ridiculous in how much love you give away. There is only one explanation. Clearly, that person got to be a follower of Jesus. Nobody in their right mind, nobody with the right limits, within reason, would do that. So that's got to be somebody who knows they've been called to love extravagantly. 
Why are we called to love extravagantly? Because that's what God has done for us. And aren't we supposed to be trying to follow Jesus and look more and more like him? Well, if you want to look like him, love extravagantly. Blow people away. Take their breath away. Leave them just kind of shaking their head going, man, I don't know what has made them like that, but I, I want to figure that out. I'd like to know more about that. Let's move on. Uh, verses 4 through 6. You, adult, you adulterers, don't you realize that friendship with the world makes you an enemy of God? I say it again. If you want to be a friend of the world, you make yourself an enemy of God. Do you think that the scriptures have no meaning? They say that God is passionate that the spirit he has placed within us should be faithful to him, and he gives grace generously. As the scriptures say, God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. So let me explain this to you uh, real quickly. It uh, says you adulterers. That's a powerful lit word. Most of us do not want to be called adulterers. And James right here is using a powerful word because he's trying to communicate something. And that is this. It would not make sense for me in a wedding ceremony to commit my life to Alana and to make vows to Alana, to make promises to Alana, to describe how I feel about her, what, uh, what I'm going to do in my relationship with her, and then spend as much time as I possibly could with someone else. There would be no integrity in that. There would be nothing about that that makes sense. That would emotionally, perhaps intimately, make me absolutely an adulterer. And yet sometimes what we do is, is we talk to God and we say that he's the most important thing in our life and we've surrendered our life to him and we want to follow him, we want to pursue him. And then what it says is, but yeah, but you're in love with the world. You spend more time doing worldly things. You have more invested in worldly pursuits than you do in me. Now, I will tell you just real clearly, okay, it doesn't matter how much I like you, I'm never going to spend more money or time on you than I do Alana. Right? Can we each say that about God? Can we each say, you know what, God, man, I spend more time, I spend more effort, I spend more thought, I spend more resources of everything you've given me on you than I do on anything else. And that's what God is calling us to. Why? Two reasons. One, he's completely worthy of that, but two, he knows that's the best life for me. I, I've never done something for God. I'm like, oh, man, that was stupid. That just created a whole mess i got to clean up. Now, I can tell you, there are plenty of times when I've spent time and energy and money on me doing something, and I've gone, yeah, okay, that was stupid. Okay, i got to clean that one up. i got a lot to you know, correct after that one. So God doesn't desire us just to make him a priority because he's an egocentric uh, individual for God. It's because he knows that's what's best for us. He knows that I focus on him, I focus on all the right things, the right values, the right priorities. So here's point number three. Okay, make sure you write this down. Following Jesus requires complete submission. Okay, for those of you who are paying attention, yes, you're writing the same thing down multiple times. For those of you that aren't, just keep writing it down. It's new every single time. All right? All right, so let's look at that verses 7 through 10. It said this. So humble yourself before God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Come close to God, and God will come close to you. Wash your hands, you sinner. Purify your heart, for your loyalty is divided between God and the world. Let there be tears for what you have done. Let there be sorrow and deep grief. Let there be uh, sadness instead of laughter and gloom instead of joy. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up in honor. Years ago, I heard a pastor um, uh, make this statement and I just thought it was really well said. He said this, the closer you get to the cross, the more clearly you will understand just how far you are from it. Let me say it again. The closer you get to the cross, the more clearly you understand just how far you are from it. Here's what that means. The closer I get to Jesus, the closer I get to understanding his absolute perfection, his holiness, his grace, his uh, self-sacrificing nature, the closer I get to him, the more I realize, oh my gosh, I am nothing like that. I have so much room for growth in my life. I have so much I need to work on. I have so much of me 
that's still in charge of my life when I'm trying to surrender that and be more and more like him. Now, here's what it doesn't mean. It doesn't mean that the more I see his holiness, his perfection, his righteousness, his deity, that I come back here and I go, oh, Tom, you slob. You know, you're just totally screwing this whole thing up. You're such a train wreck. Why would he ever want anything to do with it? It's not that. Instead, it's the more I realize how far I am from him, the more amazed I am at how good he is. You see, when, when you notice your sin, when you realize the struggles in your life, don't beat yourself up. That's Satan beating you up. That's not God. Instead, step back and just go, oh, my gosh, I just realized even more just how incredibly powerful it is that you are perfect. God, I'm trying my absolute best, and I'm not getting anywhere near perfect. That just blows me away that Jesus lived 33 years with all the pressure, with all the crowd, with all the people after him, all the uh, religious leaders trying to trip him up, and he still managed perfection. It's mind-blowing. I want to follow that God. I want to submit to him. It's not about shame. It's not about lowering my head. It's about loving him so much that it causes me, as it says, lift up your head. I will lift up your head in honor, and it's because we're looking in the right direction. Follow with me what it says in uh, verses 11 and 12. Don't speak evil against each other, dear brothers and sisters. If you criticize and judge each other, then you are criticizing and judging God's law. But your job is to obey the law, not to judge whether it applies to you. God alone who gave the law is the judge. He alone had the power to save or destroy. So what right do you have to judge your neighbor? Ouch. Okay, here's a real simple explanation to that. It just simply says, let God who gave the law determine whether others are keeping the law. God's the one that created the law. Jesus is the one that died to redeem us from the law. Let them decide if other people are living up to the law or not. Let them decide if you're living up to the law or not. Our focus is instead to be pursuing God. Our focus is to be asking ourselves, what does it look like for me to be more surrendered? Verses 13 through 17, we're going to wrap this up. Look here. You who say, today or tomorrow, we are going to a certain town, and we will stay there for a year, and we will do business there and make a profit. How do you know what your life will be like tomorrow? Your life is like the uh, morning fog. If there is a little, uh, there for a little while, and then it's gone. What you ought to say is, if the Lord wants us to, we will live and do this or that. Otherwise, you are boasting about your own pretentious plans, and all such boasting is evil. Remember, it is sin to know what you ought to do and not to do it. So here's the fourth and final point. Following Jesus requires complete submission. You and I should be so submitted to God that even our plans are submitted to him. So let me wrap up with uh, just an application. Here's your takeaway for you this week. Following Jesus requires complete submission. Here's why I've said that repeatedly. Everything else, I could give you 15 different takeaways, 15 different applications from James chapter 4 alone. But if you sum them all up, it comes down to this. If you and I would focus on living a completely surrendered, a completely submitted life to Jesus, we don't have to worry about that long list. I'll just tell you, I'd much rather try to do one thing right than to try to keep track of how many of the 15 things I got right today and how many of them I missed. So the simplicity is simply this. Following Jesus requires complete submission. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I just confess that uh, I don't get this right all the time. God, you know that. I'm not telling you something you don't know. But God, I do want to follow you. I do want to submit to you. I do want to get out of my own way. Lord, God, I pray that you would help each one of us to just begin more of our conversations with you, more of our days asking you what you want, asking you what your priorities are, asking you what you're, uh, who you or what you're working on so that we can come alongside and say, God, I don't want to be a part of what you're doing. I don't want to try to tell you what you ought to be doing. God, we love you, and we want to learn to love you and others extravagantly like you do us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
pray with somebody about, whether it's uh, something that's going on in your life this week, or maybe it's a health issue, or maybe there's something in the message that just kind of struck a chord with you, and you're just thinking, I want to pray with somebody about that. We'll have a couple of prayer partners up here, so we invite you to come up and pray with them. Again, I just want to echo what Joe said earlier, and that's uh, if you're a guest, we'd love to know you were here. We'd love to uh, be praying uh, for you. So if you would just take one of those uh, cards in the back of the seat in front of you and fill that out, you can either hand it to one of us on the way out, or you can put it on the box in the uh, lobby.